Well, due to a digital issue destroying a bunch of footage, I had to make a completely new collar to use now. But firstly, use your same coloured thread to fasten the neckline to the canvas. If our collar is basted inside of the neckline, like mine, then we can skip this step though. We also should chalk on at the shoulder and centre back the border of the collar. Line the centre seam of the melton up to the centre back seam and the edge up to the neckline. Keeping the lining out of the way, decide which side you'll begin basting and the opposite side more the basting. Carry on then to your desired side. As you're stitching around the back neck, have the fabric and collar curved over your hand in order to give the canvas some ease over the jacket. Or, to stitch around the back neck, lay it flat and mark the shoulder seam onto the collar and force the mark a centimetre behind the shoulder line in order to create the ease. We might find that this is easier either way with the neck curved over a tailor's ham. Before progressing to the forepart, secure the baste at the shoulder line Line up the brake lines, basting the collar and forepart flat together. Make sure that the brake lines are exactly matching, otherwise it'll move your brake point. Then, your collar and padding will spend their lives fighting over the border between the lapel and the jacket. Fasten the base at the bottom of the collar under the brake line, fold the collar down, and then fold the lapel along its brake line too. Hold the lapel as you want it to lay, and anchor the jacket canvas to the collar. Only the top layer though, that's what's going to hold the lapel in place, while the padding and easing facilitate that fold. Do the other side in the exact same manner, as closely as how you did it the first time. Then you need, or at least should, check that they're identical, ideally putting it on a mannequin or a person, and make sure that the lapel folds exactly at the break point. If it doesn't, then that's a non-starter, and why we secured the baste at the back side of the shoulder line. That said, start with trying to change where you anchored the lapel on the collar. Once we've overcome that little challenge, we can move on. At this point, press in the ease over the collar on the back neck. Use something to follow the centre back line up onto the collar canvas, and measure from the brake line to 4cm from the edge of our collar. Along the shoulder lines, we want to measure 4.5cm from the brake line. These are just the general rules though. Lay the fold flat and you can join up half of those lines and you could use your collar pattern to copy the line from there. Determine your collar's notch, angle and length and join that up too. I might suggest four and a half centimeters again. We want both sides identical so cut one side first and fold it over to copy off the collar. Lining up the brake lines and lapels before cutting the second side making sure that the notches on the collar are identical as well. Now cut down the notch to the very corner of the, of the lapel. Melt side up now. From the base of the cut, chalk directly down and mark 2cm down. Curving from there back into the collar. Trim away the basting outside of our new border and rebaste it inside of the chalk. Trim it away in one piece and keep it for a sec to draw on the other side.
Now check and measure to make sure that they are the same and trimming it slightly if needs be. Trim the canvases and silicia sticking out from under the gorge line to one and a half centimeters around the front, making sure that around the back it doesn't interfere with the brake line. Trim the body canvas down an extra half centimeter and then the chest canvas down another half centimeter on top of that, or under I suppose. You should also like to snip along the top of the silicia on the back fabric so that it isn't tight or pulling. With your mountain coloured thread, begin to slip stitch the canvases to the collar, going through the mountain if necessary, but still only taking a pinprick of it. Do that across to the other side, and then slip stitch the canvases de met and chest canvas that we trimmed further back to the body canvas as well. With the piece of cloth that we cut for the collar, fold it long ways and stretch it a bit without giving it a crease, and then press one edge under by a centimetre. Slip the centimetre that you folded over the collar between the canvas and the melting. Starting from the centre, baste the fabric onto the collar right at the edge to the tip of the notches. You want to not catch the melting when doing this first baste. This is why we left a centimetre from the edge when padding the under collar. If we didn't do that, we could either cut the centimetre that we folded back a little bit, or cut the stitching out if it is dense enough and there are still at least three rows on the fall. It is important that the canvas is right up in the crease of the top collar, otherwise we're stuck with a little bit of unstructured fabric flapping about in our collar. Do the same for both sides, and then do it again a centimetre from the edge, cleaning out from the first base, catching the melting this time. Still cleaning out from the previous bastes, the next line of basting will be a centimetre from the brake line, and then curving to stay a couple of centimetres from the gorge line. From the centre to either side again, slip stitch over the brake line, just between the shoulder lines. Make sure there isn't any excess collar fabric over the under collar. It should be flush all over, not unlike the body canvas.
Lay the collars flat and feel through the collar fabric to mark on the gorge line. Mark on the top of the facings to the edge of the fabric too. Give the gorge line a centimetre seam allowance, but not the facing line. Cut along the seam allowance, cutting away the excess, at the facing line, cut down to the gorge line. And I didn't, but cut away some of the excess between the two facings to a few centimetres as well. Fold the seam allowance underneath itself and baste it in place, though with some ease, such that the collar can still be folded. To check, just fold it over of course, and if it's gaping open at all, then you'll need to loosen it. Use your melting coloured thread to backstitch on the back neck between the gorge lines. Make the stitch below where the lining will be, but higher than the under collar. You want to catch through the collar canvas, but you don't want anything too visible on the melting. Trim the melting now along the top edge of the collar, a very small amount, just so that it doesn't show. Finally, fold away the triangle-ish shapes at the edges of the collar. Hold it slightly curved inwards so that they won't perk up. Baste, it, baste them in place so that it doesn't show under the collar, then cut away a little of the excess, making it straight. Then just lay it flat, melt and side up, and iron the fall of the collar, preferably not ironing on the brake line. To put the lining up at the back, you're folding the top of the lining underneath itself one centimeter. Position the center back of the lining up to the center of the collar at the appropriate height, changing the seam allowance of the lining to make sure that you have enough lining down the center at the back making sure it still has ease. I might suggest pinning it first to make sure that you have enough ease, check that it isn't tight at all, then you could do a continuous baste across. Just tack the baste at the corners.
chalk the inlay on both sides of the sleeve, the inside and the outside, so that we can accurately line them up to the inlay on the, on the armhole, and baste and stitch them one centimetre from there for the seam allowance. You could chalk two identical marks at the crescent of the sleeves in the same places, that way you might be able to distribute the crown more closely if you measure the marks relative to the shoulder seam. Double check the length of the shoulder seam, be sure that both shoulders are the same and or the length that you want. You'll be able to change the length, if necessary, easily enough though. Start with marking the front and back pitches, which are a few centimetres up from the front from the bottom of the sleeve and a few centimetres down from the back of the shoulder. The pitches are what we're going to line up the two seams of the sleeve up to. Really though, I've just marked where my inlays are, where my inlays start on the front and back. To check that the front pitch is in the right place, I line the lowest point of the sleeve hole up to the lowest point of the jacket's arm hole. I hold it there and work the seams together until you get to the short seam of the sleeve. Begin at about the front pitch by securing the two pieces together with a one centimeter seam allowance. Work up the front work up the front of the jacket a little bit, a few stitches, two or three, then flip it inside out. Personally, at this point I like to use a pin and work backwards from where we started, as there is no ease here, placing the seams together and pinning the sleeve and the jacket together where the inlay on the back starts. This way I can see all of the extra fabric that needs to be eased. With a second pin, I'll unite the hind arm seam to the back pitch, which I might move a little bit in order to give, in order to give myself a manageable amount of ease over the shoulder and at the lower back of the armhole. Remembering to line up the inlay marks, not the edge of the fabric. Proceed to baste up the front, lining the sleeve up to the inlay until the sleeve starts curving away from the shoulder seam, at which point we'll start easing in the additional fabric between here and the pin, i.e. the back pitch. It's important that you're holding the jacket underneath and curved over your hand so that you can be sure that it's laying flat as all the extra fabric is basted in place. At a few points, you might like to double stitch to secure the thread occasionally like when you get to the back pitch. Fasten the thread and there will be some ease to put in at the hind arm seam. Though the pitches are somewhat fluid, they move based on how the owner's arm hangs. You'd rotate them if you needed to move the sleeve forward or backwards relative to the pocket. If you want to move the sleeve forwards, move the front pitch up and vice versa. The back pitch more determines the distribution of the ease, how big a rope shoulder you want, and how much you can put in, I guess. Keeping the chalk, mark stitched, or basted lines denoting where the inlay is together, basting the one centimeter seam allowance from those basted lines.
When we get down to the pin, secure the thread again and baste the underarm together flat. At the bottom of the armhole, it's possible, likely even, that the two seams won't match up because the curve on the jacket pattern and the sleeve pattern were drawn differently. In this case, I suggest allowing the sleeve to sit how it pleases and following the seam allowance of the jacket. Ideally, do the first base for both shoulders, get both sleeves on, make sure they're very close mirror images. Before the second base, flip the jacket inside out to check that the sleeves do look like they're in the right place. If not, then you're going to have to take it off and do it again. Put it on a hanger, if it falls nicely, then you're good to carry on. You want the front of the sleeve to cut halfway across the flap pocket. This could change based on how someone stands, but the pocket is a good rule. If it is good, do another line of basting around the armhole, trapping in the additional fabric and distributing it more, easy, more evenly. What is very important is that if you change the pitches at all, you need to change them for both shoulders, lining up the seams of the sleeve up to the same places in both armholes. I've measured from the jacket's seam to the sleeve seams and marked it onto the other side, and measured that mark we made on the crescent of the sleeve from the shoulder seam and pinned it, pinned it in place there on the second sleeve.
Finally, press out the fullness on the crown of the sleeve. Put the crown of the sleeve over your sleeve board or similar and use water and the tip of your iron to iron and steam the fabric. I think I spent about 10 minutes pressing in the fullness, so just keep at it. It's a very important thing to do to get the fine and elegant rope shoulder. To machine the sleeve, start at the base without back tucking and following the basting, which should have been done with a one centimetre seam allowance, all the way around. It needs to be as smooth a line of machining as possible, and it's very important that you don't catch anything other than the sleeve and jacket fabric. When you get back to the start, overlap the first line of stitching by a few centimetres, negating the need to back tack at all. As you're stitching, you want to keep a long as possible flat run of fabric to sew. This will help the run of stitching be as smooth and consistent as possible. Equally as important, going around the crown and any ease, is fingering the ease as you sew along it. Make sure that the ease is sewn where you put it. It can still move and rumble over itself. Check all along the stitch line, front and back. Check that there aren't any kinks or pleats in the fabric and that the machining is straight and carries on along the one centimeter seam allowance all the way around. If it doesn't, then pick, pick out that little bit, or not sometimes, and start machining where the stitch was last correct and end where the stitching is next done right. I have I did have to make several corrections, and the corrected one is what you're seeing. I definitively would say that it isn't perfect though. Remove the basting and then iron the whole line of stitching flat.
With basting thread again, start at the bottom of the canvas, stitching very close to the seam, cleaning out from the closest baste, keeping one hand underneath to keep the lining away and the seams pointing into the sleeve, basting through the fabric, canvas, and a little bit of the shoulder pad, all the way back to the bottom of the shoulder pad, or at least to where it's basted, which should be as much as possible. Starting at the bottom of the armhole, secure some thread very closely to the stitch line and make some stitches through all layers except for the lining. So we're sewing the seam allowances together. I seem to have only done it over the pad though, but still. As it gets thicker at the shoulder pad, you'll need to stab all the way through with the needle. Though try and send the needle through at right angles, it'll be cleanest that way won't pull the pad one to one side or the other. Trim the seam allowance at the bottom of the armhole to one centimetre past the stitching if necessary. Cut down the canvas and the shoulder pad to no further than your fabric and also should be no further than one centimetre past the machine stitch. Cut the canvas flush with the shoulder pad and you could measure your inlays so that you only have a centimetre and a half at the top of your shoulder on the jacket and similar for the sleeves. Measure between about above the front pitch and to the back pitch. You want to cut yourself two of those lengths in the sleeve head. Cut the ends of those lengths into a curve and you'll want to use a steamy iron to pull and stretch those into a curve. Fold your sleeve out. We need to sew the sleeve head into the sleeve.
Start at the front side or back of the armhole and line the sleeve head up to one centimeter beyond the sleeve's machine stitch. Then the stitches of the armhole and the sleeve head should basically be on top of one another. Stitch those together on the seam allowance as close to the armhole stitch as possible without infringing on it. Do a running stitch or some combination of running stitch and prick stitch. Frequently checking that you aren't stitching over the machine stitch. Stitch all the way around. This gives you the desired rope shoulder and prevents an otherwise unsightly occurrence of the seam allowances and inlays pressing and showing through the top of the sleeve. Start with getting the lining into position, making sure that the jacket lining isn't tight at all, sparsely baste it in place around the armhole. Make sure that the pleats are in place and you have some fullness in the lining, some extra fabric so that it won't be tight. As you sew around, you might end up catching the sleeve fabric. We don't want to do that though. That'll just cause us problems and frustration. Then to infix it, use some normal thread, preferably the same color as the lining, to stitch it around the armhole along about the same line as the machining. Prick stitch or running stitch it around the seam allowance from the seam allowance side or the lining side, doesn't matter too much. Not necessarily through everything, but enough to keep it in place when the basting is removed, at which point we could remove the basting we just did. Because we line the shoulder pad up to the inlay, it should be a centimeter beyond the various lines of stitching. We already trimmed the fabric and the canvas, now we just want to trim the lining to match the jacket fabric. The sleeve lining will also need ease over the crown. Fold the lining over a centimeter. Be sure that the lining isn't twisted in the sleeve. Line up the base of the sleeve to the jacket and pin them together around the front pitch. Then following up the back of the armhole, give it another pin at the top of the seam. Make sure that the lining covers the stitching that we just did around the perimeter of the armhole. Around the crown we need the most ease but trace up from the first pin to make sure that you have enough lining to aptly cover the front side of the armhole too. And you could pinion the lining at the top there. Base the lining in place all around the armhole, spreading the ease evenly across the top. 